Thank you for joining us today. I've asked our church to gather around in their living rooms, around their devices, whether it be a cell phone, whether it be an, an iPad, whether it be a computer, or maybe your TV, and watch this broadcast of our Easter morning, April 12th, 2020. Yes, things are a little different. I'm looking at an empty church building. That's different. I've seen some friends of mine, I've seen preachers where they took their ch children's stuffed animals and placed them in the pews. I saw one where he took the cardboard faces and taped them on the pews. Uh, we might not have to resort to something like that, but I've asked you to all gather together around your devices and worship the Lord together. I'm going to ask you one thing. I want some amens on my cell phone, so if you get an amen, if you're touched, if you're blessed, Send me some amens on my cell phone. Text me. I will find them. I'm going to start with this first slide. My brother had this on Facebook the other day, and I thought it was so true. Easter is April 12th. Let me be the first one to announce it ain't getting canceled. Christ is risen. Nobody can change that. Can I get an amen? Well, I say amen to that. Nobody can change the fact that Jesus Christ is alive, and that's why we worship our Lord on Easter. As I said, the world is a little different than what we're used to. This virus has set everything out, has it stopped everything. But somebody said that they, that someone said they've lived in four decades, the 90s, then the zeros, which is 01, 02, etc. Then they lived in the 10s, 2010, 2011, 2012. And then they said the last decade they've lived in is April. And maybe March. Doesn't that seem about real? Now in five years, somebody's going to look back at all these things we've done and things we had in the history of, of this last five years, and they can say, what in the world was happening back then? Well, we know what's going on now. Yes, the church is empty, but Jesus Christ is alive. So, we have an empty tomb. We have a tomb that is empty. We have a tomb that is empty according to the Lord. We know that. Let's look at this next slide, and I hope these slides show up with this light. As you can see, I'm entitled this message to go along with our slide here. Church buildings must be are empty on Easter, but so is the tomb. John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. So we see an empty tomb. So you see our scripture has nothing to do with Jesus rising from the tomb. So let's take a trip back. Let's do what they do in the movies. They entice you with some scene at the beginning of the movie and they tell you something's happening. It looks like the end of the story. And then they'll flip on the screen and flash something back. It'll say three years before, eight hours before, six hours before, and then they start telling the story. So let's go back. Let's slip back to John chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. I've quoted this verse so many times over the years. I used it in many of our of, of funerals that I've done. But Jesus is speaking to his disciples. He's trying to comfort them. Because the first words of verse number one says, Let me let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. But he goes on to say, In my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. And I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you unto myself, that where I am. There ye may be also. So, he says, let not your heart be troubled. We're living in troubled times. Talking to my brother on the phone this morning, he drives a truck in Florida, and we call each other a couple of times a week. And he said his wife having trouble sleeping some. I said, you know what? They're saying that a lot of people are having trouble sleeping with what's going on in our world. Jesus said, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. Well... He wanted to let us know that he's alive. So we go back and he's talking to his disciples. So he said, in my father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. In other words, I'm not lying to you. And he said, I go and prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself. That where I am, there you may be also. What a promise Jesus gave us. He said, I will come again. He said, I will prepare a place for you. He said, I am going to leave. 
He said, I'm going to fix a mansion for you, and you are going to be able to dwell with me and dwell in the house of the Lord, not just for a short time. We're hoping that this season in our lives is going to be a short time and things are going to get back to normal. But he didn't say just for a short time. He said, I will dwell, you can dwell with me forever. So in this time, I want to encourage you, don't let your heart be troubled. Trust in the Lord. I guarantee you He will guide you and strengthen you. Am I going to tell you things are going to be easy in the next few weeks? Probably not. Am I going to tell you it's going to be easy to get through? Probably not. We're going to have some adjusting to do. But praise the Lord. He said, I will never leave you nor forsake you. So He said, I go and prepare a place for you. So we step back in time, back to when Jesus... We went from the tomb back to when Jesus was talking to his disciples. Now let's step forward a little bit again, but not quite to the tomb. At the beginning of the month, the beginning of March, we started a series on the seven sayings of Jesus from the cross. And we talked extensively about the first one. As you can see this next slide. Jesus said, Father, forgive them. I don't know how well this is showing up, but there's, a, there's a, the, the face of Jesus and red in the bottom. But the main thing is he's hanging on the cross. And he says, Father, forgive them. Now he's looking at this crowd. I don't know how many people were there. So let's suppose there were a thousand people had gathered. You know what it's like. It doesn't take much to get a mob together. We moved here to Bloomington in 1985. In 1987, I believe, um, Indiana University, they won the national championship. And my neighbors knocked on our door. We lived on the west side of town um, in some apartments. And neighbors knocked on the door. Two guys lived next door to us. Said, you want to go downtown and see the melee? Sure, let's go down. So we went downtown. And I had been on campus some. But we went down to Kirkwood, for those of you who, who were around here. And Kirkwood from, from, from uh, Walnut all the way down to the sample gates was packed. The street was totally full of people. Sidewalk, street, everything. We walked down through that crowd. And we went on to the campus and went down by the Showalter Fountain, and it was packed. People were just going around the fountain. Everybody was celebrating. It didn't take long to get everybody together because Indiana University had just won the national championship. Wow. But everything stayed pretty calm except for in the fountain. There's a mermaid there, squirts water out, and the next day in the news they said somebody stole the mermaid. Well, a couple weeks later, a few days later, whatever it was, they found the mermaid and it got returned. Now, move forward a little few more years. I believe Indiana University won the Big Ten Championship or something, and my son was downtown with his friends. Only the scene wasn't quite the same. A storefront downtown on Kirkwood had had a broken window, and they had a piece of plywood in the window. Well, some kids decided they were going to tear it off the window and put a bunch of stuff in the middle of the road and set it on fire. My son and his friends were walking down the street up towards the library about a block away and all of a sudden they heard some screaming and they started smelling tear gas. Well, the police were breaking it up. That's a crowd. As I said, it doesn't take long to get a crowd together, so let's imagine there's a thousand people for sake of, of just imagining there at the foot of the cross. And most of these people are yelling, they're screaming. Jesus had already been in trials. He had already been with Pilate. He had already been pushed back and forth. He had already been shoved back and forth. According to what I found out, he was presented to the crowd seven times. Seven times he was presented to the crowd and asked, can we forgive this man? And what did the crowd say? No. Release unto us Barabbas. Crucify Jesus. Crucify Jesus. Crucify Jesus. We don't want him. We, we don't want him alive. We want Barabbas. So you know the story. He was beaten. He was made to carry his cross until a man of Simon of Cyrene was impelled to carry his cross the rest of the way. And then here he is hanging on the cross. He's looking at these people. Maybe a thousand people. Maybe less. Maybe more. But he looks down at every one of them. And we know from a later discourse that Mary was there and John was there and Maybe somebody else, somebody else who had followed him was way in the background, but we only have indication of a few of his followers. And looks at this crowd. And as the words on our screen says, he said, Father, forgive them. 
You talk about some powerful words. Father, forgive them. On December 3rd, 1972, I was taken into the pastor's office at the end of a service. Brother Lloyd Stone, our youth director in St. Louis, Missouri, Victory Baptist Church, got down on his knees with me and led me to the Lord. He prayed with me a sinner's prayer. He told me how to pray that sinner's prayer. And I asked Jesus to come into my heart. When Jesus said, Father, forgive them, I was included. You were included too. Every one of your sins, if you'll trust Jesus as your Savior, He will forgive. He looked out at that crowd. After all that had been done to Him, He said, Father, forgive them. Father, my Heavenly Father, I want You to forgive them. I've done my part to pay the price. It's in process. It's in process. So, Father, forgive them. Wow. And then we're going to skip forward. We don't have time today to do all of them, but Jesus is hanging on the cross. The picture way up there. Of course, there were three crosses. But as you can see at the bottom, it said, It is finished. Wow. Tetelestai. The Greek word tetelestai, or some say tetelestai. It is finished. It's finished. Wow. When you start a project, you look forward to it being done. Let's say you're building a house. Someone is going to have a new house built for them, and all the anticipation, the foundation is started. The walls start to go up. The windows get put in. The designs are drawn out for furniture and rooms and walls and bathrooms and where everything is going to go according to what this person likes. And the excitement is all building up and crescendoing until one day they get a call and the builder says, It is finished. It's done. It's completed. And you get the permission to move into that new house. You're all excited. Everything is done. You get to move into that new house. 31 years ago, we had a chance of doing that. We bought a house, bought a modular home, and when it was done, we got to move into it. September 5th, 1989. We got to move into that new house. We went there that night, took a couple mattresses, and slept on the floor. We were so excited. We had a house of our own. We had rented places, and the last place we had rented, we had to, we had to move out. But finally, we got a call, and there were some snags along the way. We got a call and said, you know what? Let's go do the paperwork. Your house is finished. You get to move in. You get the picture. It is finished. A few years ago, I went down to the Corvette plant in, in, Tennis, in, in Kentucky. And we got to watch as these Corvettes were started on this assembly line. And we watched a couple of people who were walking down the line. Of course, they were there longer than us. But you could pay an extra fee. And you could walk with your car that you ordered. And someone would explain to you everything they're doing. It took about two, almost two days, and you could walk along beside your car and see everything that's done. And see everything that's put on it. And everything's explained to you. And at the end of the assembly line, if you pay another fee, when they say your car is finished, you get to get in that car, turn that key, and you can drive it off that assembly line. Wow. It is finished. You pay off your mortgage. You get a piece of paper said, paid in full. That's what Jesus said when He said, it is finished. Your sins have stopped you from having a relationship with Christ. Your sins and my sins have stopped you from having a relationship with Christ. And He was on the cross and He said, it is finished. John chapter 19, verse 30. Wow! If that doesn't excite you, I don't know what does. I know when I ask the Lord to save me, he saved me completely. Now, am I a perfect person? Absolutely not. If you don't believe me, talk to my wife. I won't give you a number, but I'll talk to my wife. You talk to my children. I am not a perfect person. The only ones that seem to think that I am a pretty perfect person are my grandchildren. I'll let them think that. That's okay. That won't bother Pop at all. But it is finished. Then we come to the next step. An empty tomb. But notice the words on the screen, the empty, borrowed tomb of Jesus. Have you ever borrowed something from somebody? It might be a bowl, it might be a crock pot, it might be a, a dress, it might be a suit, it might be a pair of shoes, um, whatever it is, a hairbrush, 
Hopefully you won't borrow somebody else's toothbrush. But you get the picture. Most of us have something that, is, that we've borrowed or we've borrowed something from somebody or they have borrowed it from us. What does that word, word borrowed mean? Well, it doesn't mean I get to keep it. Yes, we use the phrase possession is nine-tenths of the law. No, it means that we're going to bring it back. Somebody says, can, do you have a cup of sugar that I can borrow? Don't bring that back. It's okay. You can keep the cup of sugar. Do you have a bowl? Do you have a lawnmower? Let's use that as a good example. Your neighbor's lawnmower breaks. It comes over and says, knock, knock, knock. Knocks on that door. Can I borrow your lawnmower? Mine just quit and I've got to finish my lawn. Sure. You can borrow my lawnmower. Well, you expect them to bring it back. Why? They don't need it permanently. Jesus was in a borrowed tomb. He was in a borrowed tomb. Why? He didn't need it permanently. It was just for a short time. Why did he just use a borrowed tomb? He knew the situation. He knew the Bible said in three days he was going to raise himself up. He knew what was going to happen. He was the Son of God. So we find Jesus in an empty, borrowed tomb. After Satan had been in the background, at the cross, probably wringing his hands and smiling like a Cheshire cat, and saying, goody, 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 Jesus is about to die. He didn't know the last of the story. My wife likes to read the last few pages or, or the last chapter of the book. And if a book ends okay, she'll read the book. But if not, she won't read it. I just can't do that. But Jesus knew what the last chapter was going to be. He knew he was going to raise again. So we find an empty tomb. As you see, the grave clothes laying here. Just as the Bible said, they may not have looked exactly like that, but the grave clothes are laying there and Jesus is out of the tomb. So what does that mean for us on this Easter morning? Well, most of you know the whole story. Most of you know what happened. But let me tell you this. If that body of Jesus Christ had been left in that tomb, if it stayed there, I would be wasting my time right now. You would be wasting your time right now watching this video. We would be wasting our time worshiping the Lord. We waste our time singing songs. We would waste our time praying. We would waste our time worshiping. We would waste our time coming to church. And we might as well find a whole bunch of other things to do if Jesus' body is still in the tomb. The tomb of Confucius, that body, that dust is still there. I don't care who it is, any world religion, I don't care what it is, any world religion, the tomb of that leader is still there. But you go to the tomb of Jesus Christ and it's empty. What does that mean for you and me? It means because he raised himself up from the dead, we too, as he said, in my Father's house are many mansions. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And when you die, I'm going to raise you up too. I'm going to bring you to be with me. I'm going to give you eternal life. I didn't stay in the grave. I didn't do it for me. I did it for you. What about you? Have you ever accepted Jesus Christ as your own personal Savior? That's what Easter is all about. A living Savior. A living Lord. He says, if you'll just trust me, if you'll accept me, there are no certain words you have to say. You just have to say something like this. Lord Jesus, come into my heart and save me. I trust you that you will, you will forgive my sins. I want to give my heart to you. I want to give my life to you. I want to dedicate my life to you, and I want to serve you from here out. And forgive my sins because I'm a sinner, and I want to accept you as my Savior. It doesn't have to be those exact words. All he wants you to do is come to him and repent of your sins and give your life to him. Wow, it's that easy. An empty tomb. We live because Jesus Christ lives. Now, how do we know He lives? He lives within my heart. He lives within my heart. He changed me. When you accept Jesus Christ and trust Him, I guarantee you, He will change you completely. What a joy it would be on this Easter morning for you to accept Jesus Christ and ask Him to come into your heart and forgive you of your sins. 
Father, we want to thank you for your blessings, your grace. What a joy it is to worship and worship a Savior who has given his life, who dedicated his time on this earth. From the very beginning with swaddling clothes, death clothes, he had a mission. To save us from our sins. To save his people, to give us eternal life, to give us the joy of serving our God. Lord, touch our lives. Maybe there's some who are going to listen to this video and who need you, who need to trust you, and who need to accept you. Take their dedication, take their trust, and save them by the blood of Jesus Christ. And I ask it in Christ's name. Amen. And I have one more slide. I love this picture. Somebody has taken the time. These are, of course, pop cases. And this came out a couple years ago when I saw it. But three crosses with a purple drapery. Something like this one that we have here. But somebody in a store took time. Somebody served the Lord. Somebody loved the Lord. It blesses my heart when I see things like this. Tell somebody thank you when you see something like that. Somebody loves the Lord. Thank you for joining us on this Easter morning. May the Lord truly bless you.